Well, welcome uh, back to another conversation here at Esoterica. And I'm really excited to be joined by uh, Keith Reddy and Stuart Cleland. Um, guys, worthy working on what is one of the most important sites in the history of Western esotericism, uh, Beleskin House in, in Scotland. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, come and, and talk to us a, a little bit about what's going on with, with the house and the history and these amazing renovations and, and the foundation. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Wonderful. Um, so maybe if you guys don't mind, just maybe a short introduction uh, of yourself and kind of your connection to Western esotericism. Uh, Keith and I share an Alma. Um, um, and Stuart, we got to meet in, uh, in Ireland, uh, which was really, really great. But maybe just to introduce yourself and say a little bit about sort of your connection to, to Western esotericism. Uh, so in 2013 to 2015, I studied at the University of Amsterdam and the uh, Center for the History of Hermetic Philosophy and Related Currents, very much like you did, Justin, um, a little bit later than yourself, I believe. And my focus uh, was mostly on kind of modern, late, well, late modern and uh, contemporary, because uh, I had an interest in the counterculture years and uh, some of the impact that Aleister Crowley and his philosophy had on culture. So I did uh, my thesis work on he, his movement basically after he died and its impact in the 1960s and 70s which then later uh, after I graduated uh, became a book that was a little bit less kind of for an academic audience and kind of more broader for a general readership uh, called One Truth and One Spirit, Aleister Crowley's Spiritual Legacy, which I kind of uh, put in the history that I um, put in my thesis, but then kind of broaden it a little bit more to talk a little bit about like Thelema and kind of what it is and uh, it's, um, you know, it's current manifestation, so to speak, so. Stuart? So uh, my background was doing uh, at Exeter, the University of Exeter. I did my master's degree in the study of Western esotericism under uh, Nicholas Goodwood Clark. Uh, there I was studying Freemasonry and its kind of intersections with Western esotericism particularly how that related to Scotland and the kind of the uh, ideas of Scotland. I was really interested in how certain Freemasons were engaged with uh, Neoplatonism and Kabbalah, uh, how these ideas started to become filtered through a kind of a uh, idea of Scotland and this kind of mythical past. So over the last few years, I've uh, published on certain esoteric Masonic orders, such as uh, Elo Cohen, the elect, priests of the universe, a French Masonic order, French Masonic magical order who were interested in contacting their guardian angel. Uh, I'm quite interested uh, just now in 18th century continental Freemasonry, French, German traditions. Uh, I've published a number of translations and articles that tries to plot out these different traditions. And you also have a, a sort of the by the byline with Alistair Crowley and, and Beleskin. You also have a a uh, recent paper coming out or has come out on uh, a new discovery of about the Abra Mellon, right? Yeah, well, in my research, my Masonic research, uh, I've been looking at the uh, archive in The Hague, a Masonic archive, which had an 18th century copy of the second book of the Abra Mellon. Uh, I've been working through that and trying to translate it. And uh, what I discovered during the process of it, at least with the second book, is that it draws heavily in Luther's Bible. And as you see, I've been able to plot out the different translations and different the uh, redactions, how those the uh, Bible verses get changed, they use synonyms and change the words to try and disguise its origins. So it's led me to believe that uh, perhaps it's not a Jewish text, perhaps it's more Lutheran. Uh, but at least with the second book, that's going through the kind of doldrums of the peer review process. It's likely to come out with. Uh, in the next few weeks, the last edits have been uh, complete, and that will be the uh, Magic, Ritual, and Witchcraft Journal uh, through the University of Pennsylvania. I think it's the uh, University of Pennsylvania Press. So, looking forward to that. Nice, yeah. nice. Well, the star of the show, uh, in some sense, is, is none of us. The star of the show is, is House Beleskin, 
Uh, Keith, you want to just sort of, you know, I'm, I think many people know a little bit about House Boleskine, at least people who hang around in esoterica land, but uh, just sort of a sort of an introduction to, to this, uh, to the star of the show here. It's uh, an, an intriguing uh, property, uh, full of history. Uh, Crowley even said in his uh, autobiography that it was the center of a thousand legends by the time he bought it in 1899. Uh, 18th century manor house, um, tucked away uh, in some forest on an elevated piece of land just off of southeast Loch Ness. Uh, so this is an area that's oh that's already you know got a lot of mystery and intrigue and everything, um, and it's uh, a wonderfully interesting property because it's 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 kind of grand but sort of modest in the same sense because it's made out of this uh, this granite and sandstone, but it's not. It's made like it like a lot of the castles, but it's not a castle. It's like a, it's, it's a house, and it's got a lot of history with um, the Frasers, uh, the Fraser family of Scotland, very well uh, established um, family and clan uh, that goes back centuries, and uh, a lot of just strange and interesting stories as well, which is probably one of the things that interested Crowley to um, choose it to begin with. Um, of course, he purchases it in 1899, uh, and part of its connection with Western esotericism, of course, is that it was uh, famously used for his attempt at the Abramelin ritual or the Abramelin operation um, from the book of uh, the sacred uh, the book of the sacred magic of Abramel and the mage, which um, I think I'll, I'll probably hand over to uh, Stuart to kind of talk a little bit about. Uh, Crowley would have come across it during his time at the Golden Dawn uh, when he was initiated in 1898, and it had just been kind of really starting to be talked about. Um, uh, Stuart, you want to uh, explain a little bit more about it? Well, the Abramelin's probably one of the most famous pieces of ritual in modern occultism. And the, it's something that's become central to the Thelemic tradition. And Crowley performed that in a Baleskin house. It purports to be a, a Jewish a piece of a esoterica. It's supposed to be a, a ritual that makes one become a, in tune with their guardian angel, their holy guardian angel. And it is a lengthy lengthy ritual, one that requires a uh, purification, it requires certain uh, amount of uh, spiritual athleticism, something that takes commitment and time. Uh, it is something that, that Crowley found to be central to his work and uh, it is a real tradition uh, of itself, something that's fascinating and really I think that it is something that will be a really of interest to anybody who's interested in esotericism. The Abramelin is something that I believe uh, it really it is a great work that uh, is uh, really well regarded within uh, academic and the uh, occult circles. And the house, of course, also even after uh, Crowley uh, lived there, has uh, gone on into sort of uh, esoteric history, not just with, with Crowley, but um, uh, can you say a little bit more about sort of the later history and then sort of what happened to the house? Uh, and then we'll get a little bit into how the foundation acquired it. Yeah, well, even before Crowley's time, I mean, it's steeped in kind of weird paranormal stuff. There's a, there's a, there's a burial ground across uh, the street that used to be part of its grounds. Uh, and, you know, there's stuff from like the 17th century with ministers having to put bodies back to rest because there was a local um, uh, necromancer raising uh, bodies from the graves and, and this and that. Uh, funny enough, you can find some, some records of that where uh, people were bringing, uh, people from other parishes were bringing their dead to this graveyard and not burying them deep enough in the ground and not burying them correctly. Uh, so <laughs> the, the animals and the birds were coming and picking the bodies out of the ground. So he did kind of have to put the bodies back to rest, but in a more mundane kind of manner. 
uh but even after crowley yeah there's been some kind of funny goings on uh, um you also have uh stuff later on with uh total james bond villain type stuff where you know a guy had um embezzled a whole bunch of money by uh, a ruse of a pig farm that he had started up at Beleskin <laughs> to feed all of scotland uh with with these uh with these meat products um, but then uh, embezzled the money into offshore accounts with a, a very famous actor, by the way, back then, um, uh, George Sanders, who was the uh, none other than the villainous tiger, the voice of the villainous tiger, Sheer Khan of Disney's Jungle Book back then. Um, and then, of course, uh, Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, a uh, very big fan of Crowley in the 70s. Uh, decides to purchase the house as probably the ultimate Crowley trophy back then, right? Um, and he gets a caretaker uh, to watch over the house uh, at the time. And uh, he has, this guy has all kinds of stories about, you know, heads rolling around in the house and, um, you know, uh, strange monsters tapping at the window and, and, and everything. So um, it lends itself to a lot of stories. And, you know, it's very remote very very dark up there uh your imagination can run wild when you're up there and there's no lights uh you know it's done it to me as well um and i, I could tell you a few stories as well but um yeah it's it's steeped in a lot of uh mystery and um just weirdness really yeah I'd far i definitely prefer to live at house Beleskin than uh the, the lema abbey at chefalu uh, if I had to live in one of Crowley's domiciles, I would definitely go to Scotland and not Sicily. Um, so ultimately the house, it, it burns down, right? Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a victim of arson. And, um, and it, it burns down twice, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, is there any sense of who may have committed the arson or what may have motivated them? Um, again, the sort of the house goes, uh, unfortunately, is, is destroyed. Any sense of what happened there? Just recently, we actually got a um, request back from, uh, well, we sent a, a Freedom of Information request uh, to the fire department. And we got the 2015 fire report, uh, which they deemed um, they couldn't tell what the what the reason was they they said that wasn't arson it was more accidental probably from faulty electrics or faulty storage heaters or something like that uh and fast forward so it burns down about 70 percent of the house burns down because of this uh it's left derelict um no one's touching it it just becomes kind of a place for uh kids to go and look at the spooky house on the hill um becomes very dangerous. I mean, uh, you really have to be brave to be walking around in the place at this point. Fast forward a few years, in 2019, literally five days after we purchased the house, uh, it did become a victim of arson, uh, where somebody uh, found their way into the house and set fire to the remaining 30% of the structure. Uh, because there were still some old furnishings and stuff that hadn't been removed. So it went up in flames and pretty much the entire roof structure collapsed at that point. Uh, and, you know, we had just been left with a ruin, essentially. And so this is where the, the Beleskin House Foundation sort of, I mean, sadly, prior to it being fully destroyed, but now what you said, like you said, with the with a very important ruin. And so tell us a little bit more, maybe uh, Keith and Stuart, sort of what's the, what's the foundation? What's, what's going on there? What's the foundation doing? And uh, you know, it's really made dramatic progress. I, I followed, I'm a supporter of the, of the whole, of the foundation and, and, you know, enjoy getting the newsletter and seeing, seeing things developed. Uh, really enjoyed the AI renderings of, of some of the furnishings we can talk about, we'll talk about later, but um so yeah, maybe introduce the foundation a little bit and tell us a little bit about that. Um, I'll start and then maybe Stuart, you can kind of come, come on the back of what we're doing kind of more recently, but we started with basically just wanting to save the house. Mm -hmm. So 
one of the charitable objectives when we started the charity was um, the preservation of heritage, arts and culture, which saving the house kind of fell into that. So that was our first and primary objective. Uh, and, and it was a charitable objective in and of itself. And of course, we put on top of that, um, the facilitation of education of the public, uh, us being kind of history and heritage enthusiast, we thought this is a, an opportunity to kind of explore the history of Boleskin, uh, its estate, and to kind of also be able to educate the public um, in a way that's not this dark, spooky, hammer horror stuff that you always get about the place. Mm -hmm. So those kind of were our first two objectives. Um, fast forward into the COVID years, we decided that um, we really need to enhance our community objectives. So we added the facilitation of uh, recreational um, events so we could try and encourage people to come out and volunteer and be in the outdoors and in nature and to kind of help with um, you know mental illness and um, isolation social isolation and things like that um, and then we've more recently been uh, into doing stuff with the uh, natural preservation of, of the natural heritage um, where uh, putting in um, many acres of wildflower meadows, for example, uh, enhancing or rehabilitating our, our uh, natural wetlands in the area, um, all with the idea that we can um, really um, uh, make it kind of a community objective and to align ourselves with a lot of the aims and desires and demands of what the local community of uh, Strotheric and Foyers are, are, are wanting to do uh, in the coming years with that. Nice. And, and Stuart, sort of tell us a little bit sort of about where, where things are now. It's really been a, a, an absolutely dramatic transformation, just watching it, you know, on the internet from afar, but sort of you, 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 you've inherited a ruin and um, where are you now? Well, I mean, things are going very well. It's uh, the support that we're getting from all around the world is incredible, really. Uh, obviously, Valeskin has a, an influence on a global scale, but really it's the local people and the local community that I'm really interested in supporting with Valeskin House. It's important for me that this is a part of Scottish heritage. It's part of Scotland's kind of esoteric uh, heritage. There's so much... Uh, within the history of Freemasonry, for example, that purports to be related to Scotland, and yet its place is quite marginalised. And the foundation going forward is looking to try and be a place that is uh, integrating the community, bringing the people in the local area back into the house and being able to use it uh, communally. We've been trying to make sure that uh, the locals can make use of the facilities and make use of what's happening with the house as it goes forward, as we continue to build and turn it into something that's uh, going to contribute back. We have to try and bring the locals with us with us. There's been instances in the past where the house has kind of been on the periphery of the community. And really, we want to try and bring people in and share Valeskin House with as many people as possible. We're trying to make sure, as Keith says, that it loses this kind of spooky place on the hill, that people are able to make use of it and see it for... A, a, a space for education, a place for the arts, a place for nature. We are hoping to try and ensure that in that area of Scotland, which is quite remote and quite rural, that the house can bring something to the local community more than just visitors and tourists, that they also get to play their part and have their contribution into this uh, amazing property, uh, amazing uh, views, amazing grounds. If we can help those that are directly a, in the vicinity of the house that have grown up with it, I think that's something that uh, is about giving back. And that's what I'm really involved with. And what my passion was is to try and make sure that this is something that remains belonging to the local community, belonging to Scotland, and a centre for where we can study uh, spirituality and how uh, people in Scotland can have that kind of centre, that kind of focus 
And have, have you seen movement in that direction and in, in terms of transitioning the transitioning the 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 reputation of House Beleskin away from sort of Aleister Crowley and, you know, Jimmy Page and it sort of being a, like you said, sort of a hammer house kind of, you know, spooky place on the hill. Uh, you know, obviously you guys have a lot of craftspeople on site uh, working directly from the community. Um, have you seen that shift beginning to happen? Is it the case that uh, that it's never going to lose its reputation fully and, and nor should it? That's part of its history. But uh, as Keith and Stuart both mentioned, it, it's 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 certainly more than Alistair Crowley, the Abramelin, and Jimmy Page. Uh, has it? Uh, have Have you seen those attitudes starting to shift among the local community? Uh, yeah, I, I have only in the last two two years or so. Um, just this past year, Stuart and I had um, the great opportunity to be invited by the Highland Council Authority to speak at their um, annual archaeological conference. Uh, we, we spoke about Beleskin House, some of its um, archaeological history. Uh, you know, uh, Stuart was able to have a platform to talk a little bit about Crowley and who he was uh, to scholars and people and, you know, doing research uh, for the Highland Council. Uh, we're now starting to get funding from the local authority and from other funders for some of our uh, preservation of the natural heritage. Um, and this has only really started happening in the last year and a half, where the project's now been going on for four years. It took a little while. It took a little while, but it is happening. And it's great because, you know, uh, me and Stuart are both kind of academically inclined. Uh, you know, um, not all of our team necessarily knows about building. I have a little bit of development experience, but, um, you know, the idea is we want to show people that this esotericism stuff isn't all this dark, evil, satanic stuff. It's it, esotericism has always been about bringing the human being and nature into a kind of harmonious balance, right? So by having this built heritage uh, made by human hands and bringing it into kind of this holistic vision with the natural environment is really kind of uh, the direction we're trying to go and, and, to, and to show people uh, that there's this, this, this holistic aspect to what we're trying to do with it while maintaining its, its identity, you know, in this extremely fascinating field that we are uh, here tonight talking about. And you guys have faced hurdles with that, right? It's you've had some some uh, you know people talk about the satanic panic as being a thing of the of the eighties and nineties, but um, it's my understanding that you still guys have also it's still yeah the satanic panic is still is still with us. Could you speak a little bit about the you know your 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 brush ins with the with the satanic panic in, in Scotland vis a vis House Beleskin? Yeah, I mean, um, it took me a while to want to talk about it because it was literally directed at me personally. But um, back in 2020, I mean, the world was just kind of gone mad anyway that year with the COVID lockdowns and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, the our planning application to rebuild the house went in that, that very year. And boy, did it catch the attention of um, a lot of different people. Uh, it caught the attention of what I'd call kind of a, a QAnon cell in the UK. Um, the types of people that, you know, wanted to go out in mass crowds, not wearing masks and talk about, you know, 5G masks being the cause of COVID and, uh, you know, Satanism, you know, being uh, a, a big cabal of Satanist within high ranking areas of government, you know, trying to control the populace. And apparently, Beleskin became uh, a, uh, a satanic um, uh, organization that was rebuilding a satanic pilgrimage site uh, in the Highlands. And it got everybody riled up. We had a lot of press. Um, now, what's funny about this is you could almost understand that if it was just from very ignorant kind of... Um, highly religious people that, um, you know, want to cause a lot of trouble. 
But these people were initially actually being fed by people within the occult communities that didn't like our project. So what do you, I mean, how do you explain <laughs> people that are really into Crowley that might be part of hater groups? joining forces <laughs> with the very people they like to polemicize uh, uh, to go against this this project, just whether it's out of jealousy or misunderstanding, I don't know. But uh, we've we've had we had a really hard year in 2020. And um, we overcame it, we got through it. Uh, the planners just saw right through the ridiculous kind of accusations. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, we've worked very hard and I think we've gotten through a lot of that. Um, but yeah, it was quite a traumatic experience, I would say, you know, uh, and I know you've kind of talked about it yourself, just in uh, some of your own experiences in the past with it. It's, um, I'd never, I've never experienced anything quite like that before, but being part of a very public project, you know, you kind of almost have to be ready for. Uh, Trust that. me, having had brushings with the satanic panic as, as a young person, but also as now being the Jewish public face of esoterica, uh, the, the accusations that I get are, are fascinating. Um, it's a study in, in human psychology, the kind of things that people email me. Um, and just so, putting into the Scottish context as well, yeah. you know, like uh, in Scotland, we've had a long tradition of sectarian violence, a lot of bigotry. Uh, and the, in that same year, the then First Minister of Scotland issued a public apology for all the witches that had been burned in Scotland. Uh, and the, moving forward, the Scottish government were trying to put forward an agenda of uh, understanding to get rid of this superstition and bigotry and these ideas of the uh, satanic panics and witchcraft and burlesquing for me is a uh, part of that kind of vision to bring together people to educate them to try and break down these kind of uh, bigoted ideas about different spiritualities being somehow evil or dark burlesquing is in the highlands of scotland a place that uh, has went through hundreds of years of religious persecution and religious bigotry for that to come back in the 21st century it just is so bizarre but it's still there and a huge part of the foundation's work in dealing with a local community is to try and work in that idea of diversity and inclusion bringing people in rather than pushing people away yeah it's and it is like you said uh, Stuart. it's easy to forget that you know king james the sixth wrote one of the most influential books on on uh, on witch hunting um that had uh, devastating consequences uh, when he became king james the first uh, all through england you know he, he personally allowed for uh, matthew hopkins the witch finder general to run ramshod killing hundreds of women um uh, you know really a serial killer is what he was and so yeah it's it's that world is easy it's easy to think that the you know that the past is a different country but the the past is uh, to quote my countryman uh, from mississippi william faulkner um the the past isn't dead it's not even past and so we we are very much living with with it and in it um and that said you know you you are uh the organization is the is the um what's the right word for it? the steward of a holy site you know in the same way that you know you might have the church of the holy sepulchre or you might have a you know i don't know 770 in, in brooklyn for uh, some hasidic folks house Peleskin is a a holy site, you know, Crowley even said, I think in, uh, uh, I forget where it is, and maybe it's, in, 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 it's not in the book of the law, but uh, that, uh, you know, that you turn and face House Beleskin as if it's the Qibla. Um, how is it not only having a, a heritage site, but also being the steward of a, a religious site? And of course, you know, uh, little, giving what little I know about, I'm not a practicing occultist myself, but knowing that uh, the world of Occultists can be a very sectarian and very, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very sectarian world filled with people with very strong personalities, has been my experience. Um, how is it also being the, the stewards of a, a religious holy site? Well, our, our, the organization 
its objectives are secular, you know. So it's um, we we treat these groups as if they're just visitors that have their own personal connection to it, you know. Uh, I have a background in this as well, so I I I, I empathize with it, of course. Um, I've had people visit, and you know, they might have a little quartz crystal, and they want to go over next to the, next to the uh, the oratory door and kind of like you know say a prayer or a chant or whatever. I've had somebody jump into the <laughs> into the wetland pond in the back, you know, as if it was the River Ganges almost, you know. But um, but you know, there's also been a lot of speculation too as to um, I, I don't know how much you know about this, Justin, but there's a lot of as you said, sectarianism within the Thelemic community as well. Uh, you know, OTOers or non-OTOers or, you know, various lineages of AA and this and that. And, uh, you know, we don't, we don't care about any of that. We just want people, uh, whether they're part of this AA lineage or this part of, uh, you know, interest in Thelema or this part of... Uh, esoteric or have no connection whatsoever to any of this um, to come up and enjoy for the reasons they want to come and enjoy the house. And, um, you know, as long as it's not ill intended, they can come up and see the house, you know, I mean, you know, <laughs> if you think you're going to come up and sacrifice a lamb up there, forget about it. You're going to be turned away. You know, we won't, we won't be going that far there, but you know, um, uh, but good, you know, good to hear no animals have been harmed in the uh, reconstruction of Beleskin House. <laughs> no, no, uh, not not in the reconstruction, but there are poor deer that sometimes get caught in the fences and stuff like that, that we have to uh, we have had to call the, um, the, the 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 animal rescue line for some of the wildlife sometimes. But uh, um, no, I mean, you know, as far as I'm concerned, um, everyone's relationship with their own, you know, spiritual connection, if they have it to Beleskin, that's between them and the Lord or God <laughs> or whatever you want to call it, you know? Um, uh, so it's, uh, you know, as long as you have no ill intentions, you're welcome to Beleskin. You know? yeah, it's really wonderful to hear that, you know, a very ecumenical, uh attitude to be had that's you know ideal uh considering like you said uh, the 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 world of esotericism like any religious world can be highly sectarian and uh an ecumenical voice and and, and missed all that is uh, uh ecumenical voices in my experience just in general are uh, welcome to my ears so I'm, I'm really excited about that um so there's the spiritual side of things and then there's brick and mortar just put, putting this house together, uh, which is, um, you know, it's one thing to uh, to herd the cats that are the occultists. It's the other thing to to uh, shepherd the, the 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 stones and the tile and the slate. Um, so, what have been some of the major steps and sort of the the hurdles of of basically building a house? I mean, you 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 had um, uh, the exterior structure remained very right. Uh, it was some stone structure, but I imagine heavily damaged in the fire. The, you know, all of the, I imagine all that render had to come off, and so you're basically building a, a you're building a giant house, uh, a, a substantial manor. What have been some of the steps along the way, and sort of where is that project uh, uh, now, and what January of of 24? Well, it's taken a lot longer than we thought. Um... There's just been a lot of, uh, it's been one of those projects where it, you know, it was never going to be straightforward, you know, uh, you know, you, you dig over here and then something kind of comes up and, oh, you know, uh oh, you got to mess around with something over here and vice versa. And then, you know, you talk about herding cats, but it's, it's, it's a very similar situation where you have to especially if you don't hand it off to a main contractor, which we haven't up to this point, it's been me dealing with the various trades mm -hmm. and, you know, the trade comes in and says, Oh, well, uh, he didn't do this. So I can't do my work. And he goes back home and it's, you know, um, so, you know, it's just the standard kind of, uh, challenges of, of, of house building. Um, it's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot about 
heritage building and work and I even kind of helped lay some of the <laughs> some of the stones and stuff myself you know um, uh, but we did a lot of masonry in the beginning a lot of remedial works a lot of masonry and then we got the carpenters and the carpenters have laid the roof um, and now we're in a position where we're starting to put you know the finishing touches like the slates and the gutters and the lead work on the building and we are aimed now by july you should see pretty much a wind and water tight shell of where it looks like a building on the outside without scaffolding um you know without uh, people on the roof working and things like that and we'll be doing the internal fit out uh, hope hopefully agreeing a contract by the end of the year um, for basically the entire internal fit out 2025 and a completion in 2026. Wow. So, yeah. You know, from, from your, from your lips to God's ears. Um, I, I live, I, we bought a big old house here in Detroit. And so I also grew up in the building trades. And so I sympathize deeply with, uh, with, with, with the nightmare that it must have been to, to uh, and also again, that's a remote place. And so getting, just getting people up there, I imagine, can can be challenging. Uh, Stuart, you began like uh, sort of as a what, volunteer, maybe, and then you've you've uh, uh, become part of the the foundation. Could you talk a little bit about sort of your connection to the to the house and how you've uh, come to be a part of the of the foundation? Yeah, in the last few years, uh, I've been a volunteer and moved into being a, a trustee of the house. My background is not one in building. So that's not uh, what my uh, role is. Mine's is closer to education and kind of outreach work. Uh, I teach uh, religion uh, for a living, and I'm very keen to try and uh, help develop the uh, academic or the educational uh, output of the house. We're really keen and turn it into a place that can be a study for uh, Western esotericism. I'm keen to try and help uh, put that vision across and something that is ecumenical, as you say, something that's open and academic, secular. And uh, my passion is about preserving that Scottish heritage, especially Scottish esoteric heritage. It's something that I wanted to get involved with because, uh, as mentioned, I'm keen to bring the local community in and to have a local Scottish voice makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're talking about the uh, Highland property, it's often people from other places in the world that come in and locals can be quite resistant to uh, voices from other places. So I'm keen to try and uh, be that kind of local voice and try and preserve some of this history uh, for, for people, not just in other, the other side of the world, but people in Scotland. Uh, what I'd be trying to do with the house and my time there is to make sure that people understand really uh, what esotericism is and how Boleskin House plays a part in that, but also to try and show Scotland's part in the history of Western esotericism. Mm -hmm. There's quite a kind of Anglo-centric look when we talk about Britain or the UK uh, and Scotland, especially the, the, the Highlands and the Highland culture, is quite a kind of a misunderstood, a, a ignored part of a, a esoteric history. I mean, one of the uh, the, the man who built Boleskine, Sir, uh, sorry, Archibald Campbell Fraser of Lovett, he was actually one of the members of parliament who lifted the ban, the Dress Act of 1746, when the, the wearing a tartan and the the Gaelic language was outlawed after the Jacobite uprising. And he helped bring back and try and preserve Highland culture. And I see Boleskine House as a kind of place for that, somewhere where we can talk about, uh, you know, Highland and Gaelic culture, the mythology, the folklore, talk about uh, esotericism and spirituality in Northern Europe. I really think that uh, my place at the house is to try and help facilitate that and the uh, pull people together, try and get a, a community in the house, both local and global, to discuss these things and to uh, make it a, a venue, a place where people who are interested in esotericism within Scotland can meet and uh, work together to try and uh, you know lift a profile, understand what's happening. Because there's some wonderful scholars in Scotland 
of Western esotericism. Uh, but whereas you have uh, events in, in the continent and the uh, down south, you don't get a lot, uh, especially in the north of Scotland. And my part is to hopefully help bring that forward. So Stuart, you're just really in this whole thing to like get people to come to north to the north of Scotland so you can hang out with them. Of course. <laughs> like of I want course. some concerts in the in the in the Highlands. I'm tired. I don't want to drive anywhere. Uh, I want you know I want Jimmy Page to come to me. I'm not gonna go. <laughs> uh, I don't blame you. That's a, it's a smart move. Um, <laughs> so the the house, um, you know, one of the things we've talked about is you know this is a, a house that has lots of layers uh, of in history. And, um, you know, um, I even think about the fact that, you know, Crowley basically took a window, right, and changed it into a, a door. And, you know, even him during his time period altered the house and, you know, the house in the 18th century, certainly not the house that in many ways that Jimmy Page was living in. And so I'm kind of curious if you could talk about sort of where you intend to restore the house to. Um, you know, it's you have a lot of options. Um, and is there what is the sort of going um, the going strategy of where you're going to restore the house to, and then uh, to what degree of the Crowley area, a Crowley era stuff, uh, do you plan to 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 keep? Uh, so to answer that question, it's always funny because um, we get asked that a lot, and um, the house has had so many different owners and so many different identities, and has been refurbished and done over almost its entire history. So the question is, okay, what, what part of the house's history do you put it back to, mm -hmm. you know? And for us, it originated as an 18th century manor house, you know, and it went underwent a lot of uh, its first kind of development and expansion during the Victorian period. So in short, we want to bring in, we want to reimagine the house and its interiors in Jacobean, Georgian, and Victorian style. So that's essentially what we're doing. The only pictures we have of the house are from like the 1990s, where you have, uh, you know, zigzag sofas and, you know, uh, really just, you know, really bad <laughs> late 80s, early 90s furniture, you know, and um, uh, so, it, you know, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're, we're trying to be very, uh, so, and, and I'll share some of these, um, some of, some of these initial internal designs with you so you can put it on on the show mm -hmm. uh but you know most of the rooms are going to have panels wood panels uh at various different heights um some of it in kind of jacobean paneling some of it in more georgian kind of style pan paneling some of it up to kind of the the dado rail length of victorian period um we're bringing in wallpapers and different accents like that and uh uh wall lights um, all with the purpose of making sure that the, um, ground floor rooms, which are nine in number are going to be multifunctional for the most part. We have a library that we're looking from top to bottom bookshelves lined around the entire room, uh, to sort of a late Victorian British explorer coming back from a safari nautical maps and taxidermy gentleman's lounge in, in, in one area, uh, a lounge, uh, even a small bar with a whiskey tasting room and uh, a cinema as well, and a traditional dining room and traditional drawing room. Uh, that leaves uh, one of the most mysterious rooms of the house, the Crowley Oratory. Famous oratory. Um, so this room probably never had this in its history, but we're going to be putting it in. Essentially, we want to lend, uh, you know, we want to lend something to Crowley's legacy with this house, and that's the room to do it in. Uh, he was highly influenced by Egyptian iconography. And something that was really big in the Victorian period was this sort of um, uh, Egyptian revivalism, right? Um, 
Egyptomania, I think they called it. Egyptomania, exactly. Yeah. And there was a big movement, especially in uh, interior design, uh, with a sort of Egyptian revivalism. So we'd like to bring that room into kind of this Victorian Egyptian revivalist sort of uh, vernacular um, with a domed ceiling and, you know, the, the, the starry uh, azure ceiling. Uh, we're even talking about getting a, a, an artist commissioned to paint some frescoes on, on the ceiling. Uh, you know, just kind of make it a, a, almost that room as a, a, a work of art and a, and a testament to um, uh, just a sort of interior design, architectural, you know, work of art, really. Um, and, you know, a traditional kitchen and everything else. So um, it's really exciting. We're getting into a really exciting period with the interior fit out. That's and um, we'll, 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 there'll be a lot more in the coming months um, that you'll, that you and uh, supporters of the, of the project will be able to see. Um, and remind me, Keith, again, how, how large is the floor the, 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 the footprint of the building in terms of square meters and square feet? Um, it is 400 square meters on the ground floor. And there will be uh, a top floor on um, either wing. Uh, that is an additional like 300 square meters. Okay. So yeah, substantial. Yeah. It's, it's a large house. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. It's not massive. You can't bring hundreds of people into it at a right. time. Right. And I hear that you guys did a, a film at the site. Uh, could you um, want to play a clip from it uh, in, in just a minute, but could you maybe introduce the, the clip and tell us a little bit about the film? Stuart's Stuart. in it. Yeah, Stuart's in it. You want to talk about it? Yeah, we made a film uh, that is brought together different researchers from all over the UK. Uh, we spent three days in the house, uh, interviews talking about the history of the house, uh, what it meant to us, and the vision for the house going forward. Uh, it was an amazing experience to be in the oratory at night, lit up with candles and things like that. Uh, we had the drone footage, uh, and people from even over from Europe, excellent uh, academics that were able to lend their point of view to it. I think what we've got is a really kind of balanced and uh, sober look at the house. Often with these uh, documentaries or anything you see on YouTube about Beleskin House, it's very sensationalist. It's very hammer horror. So we've tried to go for a kind of slower, more meditative, uh, informed approach to the house. I find it uh, something that will be really of interest to people outside of esotericism. You've got the beautiful footage of the Scottish Highlands, the mist in Loch Ness. It's slow, it's meditative, it's sober. I think it will be of interest to anybody who uh, is interested in spirituality. The first essential is a house in a more or less secluded situation. There should be a door opening to the north from the room of which you make your oratory. Outside this door, you construct a terrace covered with fine river sand. When you're up here in person and you see, you know, the bucolic setting that the Highlands has of Loch Ness and the remoteness and the this, this sublime kind of feeling you get from being here and knowing uh, a little bit about Crowley's biography, you know that he wasn't just, a, you know, a, an aspiring magician. He was a mountaineer. He liked the rugged terrain of travel. He was a world traveler. So. Being here, you can kind of understand why a personality like his just came here and said, this is the place. This is where I want to be. I had picked out Beleskin for its loneliness. Lord Lovett and Mrs. Fraser Tytler, my nearest neighbors, were eight miles away, while Grant of Glenmoriston was on the other side of Loch Ness. Besides, Beleskin was already the center of a thousand legends. I mean, he talks about a method of science, the aim of religion and uh, of scientific illuminism. 
and he, he certainly had at least that goal of his magic being as as rigorous and as sort of meticulously carried out and documented as as any scientific endeavor to him at least The Abramelin uh, ritual comes from a book known as the Book of Abramelin the Sage. Now, it purports to be from the 15th century, uh, and uh, it's the, in the version that Crowley was using, there's three chapters in it, and the first chapter is a kind of folk tale about a German Jew called Abraham von Worms, who goes to Egypt to meet an Egyptian sage known as Abramelin, and he recalls this narrative to his son Lamech, book one. In book two, this is where he recalls a special magic that he learned from this Egyptian mage. And in the version that Crowley was using, this was a six month ritual split into three sections of two months each that would increase in intensity. The idea is through a, a process of spiritual, uh, physical, uh, athleticism, endurance, that you would be able to become holy and pure enough to get in contact with what was known as your holy guardian angel. This was an ancient idea, going back to ancient Greece, the idea of the daemon or your genius, this higher version of yourself. And once you had made contact with that holy guardian angel, you could then summon what he would call the dukes and the kings of hell. He was a mountain climber, he was a, a poet, he was a man who was blackmailed, he was a man who was defamed, he was a man who went through, a, tried to go through a six month ritual, endurance, that physical and mental athleticism, that strength to go through. It must have been very difficult to be the most wicked man in the world. I think that takes some strength. We hope to maybe start doing some um, different viewings of it uh, this year. Uh, we haven't we haven't released it online because it's been in some of the uh, film festivals over the last year. And it's won, I think we've won about nine or 10 uh, awards with it. Um, nice. Congratulations. So Congratulations. It's, it's, it's turned out to be very good. Um, the problem we're facing is that a lot of the networks, if they're going to pick up on it and want to expand it, they want to do the hammer horror side of it, you know? Yeah. So we're, yeah. we're waiting for the right person to, uh, help us expand it essentially but um it was a fun project and it was it was a good experience nice well gentlemen i'm i'm really excited about this whole project uh, it's not the first time we've talked about it and i'm i, I love to revisit uh, the conversation but i i guess i want to leave folks with um where can folks plug in how can folks help out how can folks visit the site if folks want to volunteer uh i know it's a bit of a schlep but uh, what are some ways that, that uh, folks watching can can plug into the the Bleskin House Foundation? There's really four ways that um, people can help. Um, there's obviously donations, one-off donations we have on our website, uh, bleskinhouse.org forward slash donate. Um, you can go to bleskinhouse.org forward slash support, and that gives you the four different ways. So we have donations. Uh, we have uh, a sponsorship program where people can sponsor uh, like a piece of the stone going into the house. Uh, and that just helps us pay for some of the thing. And then basically you get a certificate and, uh, you know, the, uh, the glory, so to speak, of knowing that you have helped us put this particular piece of uh, heritage uh, fabric into the building that will be there forevermore. Um, we have a merchandise section. Uh, we hope to expand in the future, but you can buy a piece of the old burnt fabric as kind of a, you know, a souvenir, you would say. Uh, that's been very popular over the last several years and that's uh, helped us raise a lot of money uh, for the house, literally recycling the fabric, taking stuff that can't be used anymore and putting stuff that can be used into the house. Um, so uh, there's there's that on our merchandise side. And then there's volunteering. If you can't uh, afford any of those things, um, you know, we're a volunteer run organization. 
Uh, that's probably why in a lot of ways it's taking so long because all of us are doing this, uh, you know, for, you know, for uh, volunteering our time at no cost. So you don't have to even be physically on site. We have a lot of people in the States. We have people in Europe um, that are volunteering various skills that can be implemented remotely. Um, people that are software engineers, people that are helping us uh, doing web design. You know, we're looking to kind of do 3D models of the house and things like that. Uh, if, if somebody has skills that they think that could kind of contribute to the project um, or academic essays, for example, uh, to our journal, there's all kinds of ways that people can um, contribute to the project and really help us out. And uh, um, we'd love to, you know, talk to talk to you and find out, you know, how you'd like to to help us in the future. And I'll put uh, in the description, folks, if you want to reach out, I'll put all those links in, in the description. I guess one last question I'll, I'll pitch uh, just before we wrap the conversation up, Stuart and, and Keith. Uh, House is done, 2025, 2026, you know, what event, uh, what, what thing are you looking forward to attending in the house most? What do you, what do you, I'm, I'm, I mean, aside from the, the relief of being done with the damn thing, but um, what, 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 what event are you looking forward to? What kind of event or, you know, what are you looking forward to most being able to, to host there? Stuart? Well, for me, I'd love to see a conference being held, a biannual conference, perhaps something where people from around the world can come, an academic conference, something along the, the lines of ESWE, if we could get people to come to the north of Scotland to do that, to hear them speak about uh, the importance of the house uh, and to bring a community together. If the local community could see a global community of uh, academics and the importance of the house, I think that'd be wonderful. I'd love to see some musical co uh, concerts played, local musicians playing, uh, artists having residencies, uh, writers in residence, really contributing uh, to the local community and the global community, bringing people into the house rather than it being this isolated thing on the periphery. The house has beautiful gardens. I'd love to see people in that in the summer, uh, local events and academics coming together uh, really, that would be my dream going forward. It's a beautiful vision. Beautiful yeah. vision. Yeah, I, I echo that. Um, I, I come from not only academia, but also, you know, um, entertainment and, 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 and hospitality. So uh, running various um, food and dinner and beverage events, you know, um, musical kind of discos or whatever, um, you know, garden garden planting parties. Uh, I mean, it's endless what we can do with the place. You know, um, we want it to just be a place of enjoyment that's well rounded with all kinds of different uh, things. Um, and we haven't been, we haven't developed that so much as of yet, because we've been focused on getting it to a thing that can be used. And we don't want to box it in as well. We want it to be able to have a place that um, can start formulating its own identity once it's built, you know? Mm. So um, we, we want to give it a space to have its own life. And, you know, um, you know it'll, it'll be, it, it, will, it will tell you what it wants to be used for, you know, uh, once, once it has its life. So, right. And I think that's an, an important point that uh, House Boleskin need not live in the shadow of, of the past that uh, House Boleskin, importantly, because of the work that uh, the foundation and, and folks like you and volunteers are doing is that the, the house has a future. And I think that's uh, that future focused emphasis is just as important as uh, the heritage side. And, you know, again, Alistair Crowley and all that. I think that that's a, uh, a really important place to yeah, to, to leave the conversation that it's a, a house with an incredible past, but it's also a house that's going to have an incredible future thanks to to the work that uh, folks like y'all are doing. So thank you. Um, I hope also uh, that uh, Esoterica can also one day 
um, maybe hold a, an event out there. I'd love to come visit and do a kind of esotericon um, at House Beleskin. So if, if you if you would have me, I would love to work with you all at one we'll point someday to, to, to manifest something like that. So you'd be more than welcome, Justin. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to, to talk about House Beleskin and uh, get a little bit of an update of where things are and where things are going. And I uh, just want to say congratulations, uh, you know, that you've, uh, you, you've done a lot of hard work and uh, fought the satanic panic and uh, brick by brick and stone by stone and slate by slate, uh, the house is going to have a future and you should take great pride in that. And I appreciate the, the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you.